in depth with Don Smith, we welcome Rebecca McPhail, Executive Director of the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, and Bill Bissett, President of the Huntington Regional Chamber of Commerce. They will discuss legislation addressing manufacturing and economic development. Welcome to In Depth. I'm Don Smith, and today we welcome Rebecca McPhail, President of the West Virginia Manufacturers Association, and Bill Bissett, President of the Huntington Regional Chamber. We're looking at legislation addressing manufacturing and economic development. Welcome. Thank you. This has been a session that has had to focus on education, teachers, PEIA, but there are some very important pieces of legislation addressing economic development in West Virginia, addressing manufacturing, things that your groups have been working for years to move and they seem like they have a chance. Uh, we're getting, we're past the midway point. I wanted to talk a little bit today about what's happening, what's out there, your number one priority, and what West Virginians need to know and might not know about some of these pieces of legislation. And I think the, from talking earlier, the number one thing I want to talk about is HCR 106, which probably to the people of West Virginia is the governor's just cut taxes and win mm -hmm. amendment bill. Uh, I'll let both of you come in, but where are we with that bill? How's that bill doing right now? What are we seeing? Rebecca? Well, um, Don, thank you again for having me here today. That has become HCR 106, our primary issue this legislative session from the Manufacturers Association perspective. Um, right now, the bill hasn't moved through committee, um, but has been introduced as HCR 106 in the House and SCR 9 in the Senate. Um, there is a possibility that that bill could run as early as next week, but obviously there are a lot of issues um, of importance at the session this year, and so it's been a little bit of a slow start. With every session, you expect the unexpected, and obviously right now we're embroiled in a discussion of teacher pay raises and other issues along with PEIA, and we still, I think, have to focus on what's important to grow the private economy in our state. In an area like Huntington, we're seeing some economic development, we're seeing some optimism, but we want that to continue. And when you talk to business owners or economic developers, there's a real concern about inventory taxes, about things that are causing us to be held behind while other states are seeing growth. We're seeing growth in Huntington, but want to see more, and hopefully we can get success of our legislature to have those successes happen. As I've studied the tax situation and I've followed the West Virginia Forward Program, mm -hmm. it talked about West Virginia's overall tax package and it said it was pretty good, probably in the top 20, but the inventory tax was an outlier. And in our conversations getting ready for this, you pointed out that none of the contiguous states around West Virginia are at anywhere near the level we are. Some don't have it and I think Kentucky is maybe 10% of what we have. Uh, Bill, you're in Huntington and Rebecca, you have members all over the state. Uh, how is that impacting West Virginia day to day outside of the session? What, what are you seeing with your members and your operations throughout the year? How does this impact operations? I think it hurts an area like Huntington in two ways. I mean, we have Kentucky and Ohio in walking distance. So if I'm an existing business and I'm building a warehouse, why don't I build it across the border? Why don't I invest over there where I don't have to pay those kind of taxes? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if I'm a new business looking at where I can be and I need maybe the transportation infrastructure we have in Huntington, why select West Virginia when I can go somewhere else nearby, still get the benefit of that rail or river system, but be elsewhere and not have to have this kind of onerous tax? For manufacturers that have been doing business in West Virginia for decades, um, this is a definite impediment. You know, we're at a place where it's time to make decisions about capital investments. Do we add new equipment? Do we add new machinery? Or can we go someplace else and do that? Uh, just before I came here today, I got a, a Google alert about a company manufacturer in Raleigh County that's opted to leave West Virginia and move to Virginia, where this is a completely different um, treatment from a tax perspective. And those decisions are going to start happening more and more. Well, one of the things that I found in the questions is how competitive it is to attract new business to West Virginia, but Rebecca, you brought up also, and as you're pointing out, retaining the businesses. Uh, this week, the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce had a breakfast meeting, and Commerce Secretary Woody Thrasher said, I asked the question about how important this tax was to businesses looking at West Virginia, and in particular, maybe along the natural gas development. And he said it was probably the number one thing they looked at. It would, it would be a huge decision on whether they choose West Virginia or Ohio or Pennsylvania or someplace else. Right. And what makes it worse is we've had this for decades. 
You know, this is a problem that we've continually tried. I talked to a legislator recently who hasn't served in quite some time. He was trying to address this back when he was in the legislature. So this is something we have to fix, I think, not just for right now for the opportunities of natural gas, but for the future as well. That's what I think is so frustrating is we've been trying to do this for a long time, which makes it more, even more imperative. Yeah, Rebecca, you had brought it up that that had been a priority for your organization for for, for a decade or more than a decade. Two decades. Um, and certainly now we've seen some changes at the federal level mm -hmm. from a tax perspective and reshoring, if you will, of manufacturing. You know, the challenge that we have in, in not acting on this particular amendment is that we watch all the states around us who are much more competitively placed and positioned for attracting that reshoring take advantage of opportunities and, and we miss out. Well, I've heard that we we are right now the legislature is looking at how much money they can provide commerce to try and bring business in. Uh, they want site money. They want to do some things that would help. But if we're also facing this challenge, it's just that much harder Absolutely. to get somebody in. It, and it requires money to make money. I mean, the other thing I think when you hear from Secretary Thrasher, who's very eloquent about this, we've got to fund the Department of Commerce where it can compete. I think not only with contiguous states, states, but across the country and across the world. It's hard, I know in some cases, when you face a you know small state, rural state like we are, but at the same time, there's opportunities here, but we have to sell them. What I hear from economic developers all the time is West Virginia is a blank slate in many ways when it comes to economic development. We've got to tell our story, and only West Virginians can do that. Right. And Rebecca, I want to ask you this in particular, because I think one of the things that people don't realize, and I know I didn't realize, is this tax isn't a growing revenue stream for West Virginia. Uh, the, whether it's forcing people out, whether the competition is attracting, attracting people to other states, but we're seeing less revenue from this tax every year. Can you address that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, one of the primary concerns in the past when this, legisl uh, when this policy has been addressed is the potential loss of revenues to county governments and schools who benefit from the inventory machinery and equipment tax. That's been addressed in this bill and everyone took a hard look at those revenues which have steadily declined um, to the tune of $40 million for the last five years. Now what that means is that those counties um, through HCR 106 can lock into current revenue levels and have some certainty where they haven't had it in the last several years. Bill, how's the Huntington area? What's going on in that? That's a, that's a very competitive market. How are things over there in your market? You know, it's interesting right now, Don. We, we are literally cutting a ribbon, it feels like, every four days. Um, we're running out of ribbon. I mean, it's kind of a fun time to be there. You're seeing entrepreneurs, young people start businesses, and yeah, restaurant, service industry, but also people making things. And there's an optimism. We have trouble quantifying what it all means, but I think you're seeing, you know, whether it's connected to tax reform, whether it's just overall optimism, People want to do business in our area and live there. So there is good news, but we have to share that good news. So there is an optimism. I think the thing we need from the legislature is to propel that further. And we hope, you know, especially with this, when we look at the, some of the taxes that don't make us competitive, we have to find ways, I think, to at least be on the same playing field as other states, if not do better. Right. Rebecca, I want to come back to the point you made about the counties. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a broad sweep that, that the legislature hasn't thought out. This is a pretty narrow niche they're looking at right now in terms of it'll it'll cover about hundred forty million dollars of the tax it doesn't impact everybody um, why was that what's the reasoning behind that you think well certainly um, there's a realization that we've had some fiscal issues um, in the recent past in the state and so the approach was surgical um, so there was a, a careful analysis of of what would generate the most return, the most immediate um, return from an economic perspective in how this um, tax repeal would be carved out. So you look at industrial inventory machinery and equipment manufacturing right. um, and how that multiplies um, from an economic growth perspective. For every one manufacturing job, you can count on at least three indirect jobs supporting that industry. So if you're able to attract 100 manufacturing jobs, that means 400. Um, you know, in the aggregate, and that makes a difference. That makes a quicker impact. Um, it gives the state the opportunity to be responsible in how um, they budget for those changes, and it allows them to make the counties and schools whole by using a figure that um, is something that's achievable. Well, that's great. I know meeting with the County Commissioner Association, some other groups, 
there is worry in the counties around the state about doing that. And I think one other thing that is not clear around the state, and I want to make sure that we touch on that as we, as we close out, this is an uphill fight. This bill doesn't end this discussion. If these bills, or a, ver a variation of these bills, pass, that just allows the state and groups like yours to, to talk to the people of West Virginia. We can both talk a little bit about what the, what the people can expect in terms of education about this and what will happen if this bill passes. To your point, this is um, an, an amendment that would require um, a vote of the people of West Virginia to determine whether or not these taxes should be repealed because it, it requires a constitutional amendment. So I think what we are trying to help people understand right now is that the legislature isn't voting to repeal the tax. They're voting to give West Virginians an opportunity to determine how we invest in our economic future. Um, beyond that, our job is to show um, and to demonstrate what that type of change could could compel in terms of economic growth and that that stability is needed in those county and school revenues um, and that it's a foundational issue uh, for economic growth. Okay, Bill, you're the chamber. You guys do a lot of educational programming, things to keep your members and the public informed. The public around West Virginia, if, if this bill for the amendment passes, can expect to see a lot more educational material out, a lot more programs from groups like yours? I, I think it's always going to be, what does it mean to me? You know, how's it going to affect my, you know, my personal income, you know, my budget, what I'm trying to deal with as a, as a West Virginian, and that's what we have to reach. I think you saw that with the outreach with the road bond and what it can do for us economically. It's going to be very similar in this as we try to grow a private sector in this state. We still have a lot of counties that have a greater public employment than private employment, and that really worries me as a West Virginian. We've got to have that private sector grow to be able to support a lot of the services that we all expect, like good teachers. Well, it sounds like there'll be a lot more discussion coming forth from the legislature on this, and then the question to the voters of West Virginia if it passes. I want to thank Bill and Rebecca for joining us and providing more information. Thank you for watching In Depth. Next on West Virginia Insight, Betsy DeBoer looks at tourism in the Northern Panhandle. West Virginia is full of wonderful tourism attractions, and the Places to Go section of the Office of Tourism's website, gotowv.com, shows them in nine travel regions. For the Northern Panhandle, you'll find the top 10 must-see stops. The list is impressive. From West Virginia's Independence Hall, to the Grave Creek Mound Center, to the Homer Laughlin China Company, GoToWV.com offers a three-day itinerary for the Northern Panhandle. But with Willing Island and Mountaineer Casino in New Cumberland, three days may not be enough time. This year, head north for a great vacation.